The game is over. The Rebels have won. Yeah! The 4th of March 1994 was one of the most important days in the history of modern Celtic but unlike other memorable dates in the club's long history, this one was far more significant for what was happening off the pitch rather than on it. It's now exactly 30 years since Fergus McCann's takeover of the club as he took control from those who had taken Celtic perilously close to extinction. In this very special series we are speaking with some of the key players involved at that crucial time and on that note I'm delighted to welcome David Lowe to the Celtic Exchange. David, 30 years on, how are things today? I think today are pretty good, or they were till yesterday. You know the the, the Hearts game, another uh, strange decision from Mister Beaton off the park. But uh, by and large, I'm still positive about this season and our possibility of winning the league. Good to hear. As I said in the intro, there we are almost exactly to the minute, thirty years on. So we're recording here on Monday, fourth of March, twenty twenty four. It's around about ten thirty. What were you doing uh, this time thirty years ago, David? You mean literally this time, quite, half past ten, quite 1994? Literally. Well, that was the day that uh, you know, Fergus got off the plane from New York. That was the day that I uh, picked him up at the airport. And that was the day that uh, we went to his bank in St Vincent Street to make sure the money was in place to transfer to the club's bank in St Vincent Street, further up the street. Uh, and, of course, we had to get the money there by 12 noon uh, because the bank said that if they didn't have a million pounds by 12 noon uh, they would put the club into receivership is what you basically called administ it's called administration now so you don't really want to be playing a uh, russian roulette or poker about whether they meant it or not i personally believe they did mean it and because uh, i think they would have passed the club on to somebody else if, mm -hmm. if they hadn't had the money so running up the street sixth floor of the Bank of Scotland behind the big oak desk signed the papers uh, and I looked at my watch and it was 11.52 uh, so they got their money with uh, eight minutes to spare yeah and the rest is history and the rest is history yeah yeah and we'll get to some of the finer detail as we go through David but it's, you know certain Celtic fans of a, a certain generation will be all too familiar with some of the stories we're about to cover and, and many of the key, key players involved David but for anyone unfamiliar, could you give us just a short intro to the role that you played around about that time of the takeover in March 94? Well, I, I was a sort of young investment guy, I suppose, but also a big-time Celtic supporter. I'm one of these Celtic supporters that was born at the right time. The right time is you're coming of age in the mid-60s uh, at the same time as Jock Steen's joining Celtic, at the same time as we're on a journey to uh, nine in a row, at the same time as we win... Uh, the European Cup a couple of years later. So somebody of my age has known nothing about, but success from the mid-60s, I suppose, into the 70s, 80s of a fashion. But uh, by the late 80s, it became apparent to me and a few other people that, you know, we were going nowhere because the game had changed. What had happened is that... Uh, with the election of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, the financial markets were all liberated. It became much more easy to borrow money, no matter what kind of business you were. You could even get a, a mortgage uh, from a bank. Mm. You couldn't get that uh, in the 70s. It was it was uh, building societies you had to go to, and you had to have a 25% like deposit, and you had to crawl on your hands and knees and hope that the building society manager gave you the money. So that was the environment up till the mid 80s really I suppose and in the 1980s or the first half of the 1980s just to put all this in context you know Rangers were the fourth best team in Scotland behind the new firm uh, and Celtic those three clubs shared the championships throughout all of the, the early 80s and uh, Rangers had their own putsch uh, their own takeover in a 1986 uh, a guy called uh, Lawrence Marlborough, who was the grandson of uh, John Lawrence, I think it was, living in Nevada. Uh, he said, enough's enough. It's got to be a takeover. He took over the club or took a controlling interest in the club. And guess what he did? He borrowed money from the bank. And with the money he borrowed from the bank, he uh, bought players with borrowed money. 
and that meant that uh, you know Rangers started to, and they brought Souness in as well. It was Marble that brought Souness in, not not any David Murray, and half the England team, not literally, because uh, they couldn't play in Europe because the Heisel and the hooliganism. So suddenly, you know, Rangers had a bigger and a better squad. They had bigger and better players. Uh, they had the backbone of the England team, and they did that with borrowed money, and they went on a run. Meanwhile, on the other side of the city, Sleepy Valley, you know, they, they're they oblivious to all of this. They just think it's part and parcel of the cycle that goes on between Celtic and Rangers. You have good spells and you have bad spells. But what you really had is a change in the dynamic. The game had changed. It was no longer about just living within your means. Before you could borrow money, if you were a big team in a big city, you had more fans and therefore you had more money and therefore you had better players. But you all live within your means. All that changed in the mid-80s. And, of course, when David Murray uh, took over Rangers uh, a couple of years later, he upped the ante again by uh, borrowing even more amounts of money. Again, this is all passing the old Celtic board by. They just think it's part of the natural order. Our time will come. It's their time just now. And, of course, that wasn't the case. The game had changed uh, and you needed management. You needed money uh, and you needed a plan for uh, building a stadium because uh, the Taylor report, again, to do with hooliganism and fires, I think it was a big fire at Bradford, if my memory serves me correct, uh, compelled the British government, insisted that uh, by 1994, all football stadia had to be all seated. And we Celtic, you know, had uh, 8,000 good seats in the the old stand or the main stand, whatever you want to call it, and the rest was just standing. So we didn't have any money for the team. Uh, we didn't have any money for the stadium. Uh, we didn't have any money for anything. <laughs> and uh, all the and at this point, you know, when I, I'm, so I'm doing my job, I'm, this is all part-time stuff. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just clocking all this stuff. Uh, you get into six in a row, seven in a row, <laughs> all that kind of thing. Uh, so... I found that very uncomfortable, uh, unpalatable. But I wasn't the only one. So eventually, the sort of the I suppose you could say the the Celtic board at the time realised there had been a dynamic shift in the game. And again, this is all from memory a long time ago. I think they brought in uh, Brian Dempsey and Michael Kelly, mm -hmm. a Mr. Glasgow, uh, Lord Provost. You know, Glasgow's miles better, all that stuff. Uh, as this sort of uh, commercial, uh, more business-oriented guys. Um, and funnily enough, I was employing a Michael Kelly in a PR capacity at the time, so I sort of knew the guy uh, and who he was, the family and all that. Anyway, Dempsey got sacked, you know, within a year, and that's when I really started to take notice. I mean, what have they done that for? And then when I looked into a little bit more, I basically came to the conclusion that the White Kelly... And Grant faction, you know, put their own interests above the club, and that there was no way, you know, they would tolerate strangers or they would tolerate any business plan that involved prejudicing their status. It was the only thing they had that sort of rose them above the ordinary guy in the street, gave them this special privilege. And I came to the conclusion that they would settle for you know twenty fallow years as long as they kept control. And at the end of the day, that's no good. You know, we want Celtic to be winning things. Again, people of my age, older people, like my friend sits next to me, Peter Riley, you know, he's, you know, he must be about 80 now. You know, he remembers how shit it was, you know, mm -hmm. before uh, Jock Steen came, as do others. But people of my age, no way. We are not mm -hmm. going to be second fiddle to... And I was just going to say, around about that time then, so around about 1991, I think, you're right, Brian Dempsey had come in. I, th I think I read that he only lasted five months on the board. There was clearly um, some resistance from Michael Kelly, um, predominantly, amongst others. And around about, about that time in 91, I think you became aware of just how much trouble Celtic were in uh, under the likes of Michael and Kevin Kelly, Chris White, Tom Grant, David Smith, all on the board. And at that time, they asked their own lawyers, I believe a group called McGregor Douglas, to look into matters. Uh, McGregor Douglas then raised various concerns and used a line here which I thought was really interesting. The line said, The position is serious enough for the directors to be required to contemplate future possibilities which up until now have been unthinkable, like the demise of the company or its acquisition by someone with access to huge funds. 
Was it this kind of information, David, that triggered you into taking more action and, and getting more involved in some way? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have sort of already worked that out myself. You know, at the end of the day, it was from a football perspective, you know, they were confined to being second fiddle for the foreseeable future. Not acceptable. From a financial uh, perspective, pretty much the same. They just didn't have the money to compete uh, a competitive, in a competitive manner uh, in this new environment. So something had to give the people that were in charge, didn't get it or weren't prepared to do anything about it. So if you can't get an agreement through consensus, you have to get an agreement through something more aggressive. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with being aggressive and for something like Celtic, which is so close to uh, my heart and, you know, hundreds of thousands of others as well. Mm. But what I'm saying is it had become apparent by 1990, 91, even to the board, that what they were doing is looking for solutions to the problem, which everybody knew about, that didn't involve them having to exit stage left. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of the day, nobody's going to put the money in unless they're in charge of taking the thing forward, and that was what the problem was. Now, Fergus McCann knew this. Uh, you know, I didn't know Fergus uh, in, until 1992. But unbeknownst to me, from the late 80s, he's aware of all these problems, as are others, and he's going to the board. He's he sold his company in a... Uh, in Bermuda, you know, he's cash rich, uh, he's a very big Celtic fan he, to this day, he always has been, mm -hmm. I mean, you all know the story of it, Croy, Secretary of the Croy Celtic Supporters Club, all that stuff, yep. the real deal, in it for the right reasons, uh, wants Celtic to do well, so he'd been approaching the board since the late 80s, you know, when it became apparent that, you know, Rangers were going north and we were going south, but they would listen to him then, he would they would say, hey, when are you get home for us? You yeah. know, they just weren't interested. Uh, so they were looking for solutions that didn't involve them leaving and no such thing exists. So uh, there had to be something aggressive uh, in order to uh, change the dynamic, as I call it. So what I did was I sort of reverse engineered the, the share register. You didn't have access to all this on online stuff back then. It was all order it, it arrives in the mail, you know, it's all paper everywhere. But basically, uh, once you'd done your analysis, you basically found that nobody was in control of Celtic. The board did not have control of Celtic. What they had was a, a Warsaw Pact arrangement. Uh, that's a non-aggression pact for uh, younger people. Um, and that bound them together. What was apparent that they didn't really like each other. The only thing they had in common was Celtic. They knew that if they weren't together, they, they would have to leave so they had this arrangement whereby they stuck together and it gave them 60% of the club the other 40% was treated like shit you know uh, they weren't spoken to they they were just ignored so what I did was look at who owned the 40% uh, there was former chairman's wife in Edinburgh had a big shareholding there was Felicia Grant's extended family and that was the old Irish lady that everyone used to hear about she died and gifted their shares to Canada and Ireland and Tom Grant's father. And then they'd split again, but I sort of added them all up together and worked out who owned what. Uh, Patsy Gallagher's son uh, owned some shares, etc., etc. So basically, uh, I worked out that if you could consolidate all of this and give yourself 40%, then a uh, break into the Warsaw Pact, mm -hmm. you know, break it up. Uh, get Tom Grant to be on our side, you know, we'd have 60% and they'd be in their minority and we would uh, take the thing forward and get the money and do all the things that they weren't prepared to do. Yeah. So that, that, that was a bit of research I did in the, start of the early early 90s mm -hmm. before I'd met Fergus. Yeah, and even before we get to Fergus, who, who were the guys, so you, you speak in, in your book, so the McCann Takeover, the inside account, um, you speak about quote-unquote the new alliance which was kind of formed at that time. Can you just clarify, I suppose, who that was? So yourself... John Keane, I believe, was Brian Dempsey part of that? Yeah, so even to this day, I, I, I don't sort of hang about in the hospitality. I sort of wear jeans and T-shirts and go to the game with my mates. So I, but there was this sort of uh, hang about the boardroom crowd. Uh, back in the day, they all had camel coats and things like that. <laughs> and they would uh, you know, talk about Celtic. So there's a little crowd of people, uh, corporate people, um, and we all sort of, in different professions with different interests, 
Uh, one thing I did notice again, n nobody really got on. The only thing we had common was Celtic. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, you, you didn't really get on with all these people. You just wanted Celtic to do well. So more, you know, I met Brian, Brian Dempsey, John Keane, Jack Flanagan, Eddie Keane, Dominic Keane, uh, and a few others as well. And we all used to moan about. Uh, how awful the outlook was for Celtic. He used to go to away games and get drunk and moan about it. and uh, But nobody would do anything about it. And the amount of times I was told, oh, you'll never, you'll never get anywhere. I uh, right, <laughs> you know, if you don't put the effort in, you, you won't get anywhere. But uh, yeah, the, the, all these names that I've just mentioned and a bunch more were all sort of uh, hovering about. Mm -hmm. And then... I can't remember who it was, but one of them said, you know, there's this sort of eccentric guy in Canada who's really serious. You should go and see him because he's got a lot of money and uh, he's keen to do something. And uh, he's been over a couple of times and he always falls out with us and goes home. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I said, okay, fine. You know, you don't put the miles in, you don't get anywhere. So uh, this is 1992 mm -hmm. now. Um and I went to see, and this is, I suppose, a pretty seminal, this is a seminal week now, 1992. So the week starts off with me meeting uh, Fergus McCann in Montreal, and I tell him the plan. Now, if you want detail, you know, I, I met, made, made me a cup of coffee, and it was brimming, and I was dead keen not to spill it. You know. Anyway, he sits me down and says, who are you, why are you here, and what do you want? <laughs> and... Uh, Right up my street, you know, no bullshitting. There's mm -hmm. too many talkers in and around Celtic. And this guy wants to know. So I tell him this plan. I'm going to buy all these shares. And, and I'm seeing a guy in Toronto uh, tomorrow, um, Jim Doherty, funnily enough. And then I'm going to Ireland to see his relations with him. And then I'm going to see Betty Devlin in Trinity Edinburgh. And then I'm going to see, going to see, uh, you know. So <laughs> Ferris goes, eh, that's a really good, uh, you have my support for it, but I'm not giving you any money. All my money goes to the club, not to the people that put it on its knees. <laughs> Again, that's fine. You know, you stand day one. You're not going to, there's no second meeting needed. Um, and he was as good as his word, I have to say. Two years later, because it mm -hmm. took two years, didn't put any money into buying shares, did put all his money in to the club when he got the chance. So that was a very positive meeting. And I left that meeting. Uh, that's fantastic. He's going to put five, six, seven million quid into this. And he's got a mate. Is going to put a million quid into it. Uh, so we're way up here. This is good. Then I go and see uh, Jim Doherty in, in Toronto. And he's right on side. The guy's running a club, bunch of bastards, Dave. You know, uh, I'll support anything that, you know, turns the fortunes around. Uh, no problem. And I've got the proxy for all, all my aunts. And that was like 5 6%. Six I can't remember the exact number. So he's on site. Then we fly to uh, Belfast. And we're running through the streets. This is before the Good Friday Agreement. He's shitting himself. Sandbags everywhere. Soldiers with guns and all that. <laughs> you know, I thought it was in Beirut or something. Anyway, we were going to see his family in, uh, where was it? Toombridge, uh, County Andrum, uh, in a hotel. And they're all sitting there. And yeah, we we're in. So you got another 5 6%. So that's 10 12%. Uh, off to Edinburgh. Betty Devlin, she's in. Uh, Willie Gallagher, that's the son of uh, Patsy Gallagher. He's in. Uh, tell a lie, I'm getting. Yeah, there was two Gallaghers. There was Willie Gallagher and there was Patsy Gallagher's son in Dundee. Mm -hmm. He's in. He's a journalist in Dundee. Tommy Gallagher, that was his name. That was uncle of Dundee United player, Kevin Gallagher. Kevin, yeah. Uh, so everybody speaks is in. So suddenly I'm going back to Glasgow with. 30% of Celtic in my back pocket <laughs> in six days. And can I just touch on that as a, as a strategy? So the main issue overall, David, and, and I think most folk know, was the, the closed shop nature of what was going on with the, the dynasties, the Kellys, the Whites, the Grants holding too much power. And in terms of the strategy, I, I picked up an interesting part in the book where you talk about the blue, blueprint for the strategy or the takeover being inspired by the book, The Prince by Machiavelli. Uh, something about making a takeover without actually making a bid. And there's a line in the book which I think is interesting. It says, The weapons in the war would be shareholder lists, proxy agreements, company law, contacts, meetings and money. 
The army would be shareholders and supporters, people who had been forgotten or ignored, punters whose views were not taken seriously enough. So can you tell us just a wee bit more in general about about that approach, that strategy? You know, starting at the end, you know, any takeover, any company requires usually the support of the, the shareholders, but in a football club like Celtic, it re- requires the support of, we'll call them customers for the sake of clarity, fans, mm-hmm. you know, because you want their buy-in, um, you want their support, and that was, Ferris McCann knew that uh, as, as well. So that was at the end, but at, at the beginning, you know, uh, I mean, I had just read the pr- the Prince, you know, which is uh, the Chinese versions with Sun Tzu, you know, the art of war. It's the same thing, you know. It's different strategies for different scenarios. If you try to be upfront in the Celtic situation, you get no fair, nowhere. You had to basically be pick up these shares behind the curtains, so to speak, mm-hmm. uh, because if the board got to know what you were up to, you know, they would try and disrupt it, stop it, or bribe one of the key shareholders. So it was all done in, like I said, less than a fortnight, I suppose, you mm-hmm. get 30%. Now, we, we already had 10% of the club. And I, I hope you want this level of detail. Yeah, because uh, it's, there is a lot of detail here. So if I go back to the Brem, Bremner days, uh, so that was the chairman of this company, which had a stockbroking subsidiary, which was closing down. So in the midst of closing it down, a letter came in from uh, from California, uh, a J, uh, James Graham Kelly from Oceanside, California, saying he, he wanted to sell his shares in the Glasgow Celtic Soccer Organisation. <laughs> and uh, I thought, that's brilliant. These shares never become available. Uh, and I told Michael Kelly this, and he said, oh, you can't buy them because uh, they have to go to the board. Well, that was a perception. They had to go to the board, but mm-hmm. well, they don't. So that that's, wasn't true. And what it really meant was uh, you, anybody can buy the shares, but the board won't register the transfer and, and enter it in the, the as an ownership in the statutory books. So, and the board tried to buy these shares for like three pounds a share, but I had them valued by firm called Rutherford Manson Dowds, I think they were taken over by Deloitte or something a few years later, uh, at £60 a share. And I wanted to buy them, but I couldn't buy them because of the conflict of interest. So I put them out to tender with another stockbroking firm, BWD Rendsburg, and they were sort of touted around to possible buyers. Um, and they ended up getting purchased by John Keane, uh, one of the heroes of all this time because mm-hmm. uh, he delivered everything he said he would do as well. So John ended up buying these and that was a bit, it was a bit, it was a, it was a decent shareholding and other shareholdings because of this they started becoming available. So we built up a 10% shareholding. But the point I mentioned in that story is that it's a s- almost random act whereby a Kelly, an American Kelly in California gets in touch with a stockbroking firm that I'm shutting down. And you'll say, well, that's why was that? Well, the reason why that was was because Sir Bob Kelly, the sort of famous Celtic eccentric chairman, worked there whilst he was alive, obviously, in the 60s, 50s as a stockbroker. And the, the club had maintained this sort of a relationship with car, the firms called Carswells, with Carswells. And that's why... Uh, and I was employing, funnily enough, Michael Kelly, you know, for Bremner Stroke Carswells. So almost by serendipity, all that uh, seemed to f- slot into place just uh, without any proactive intent. It just, mm-hmm. just happened. So picked up some shares, picked up some more shares, bought all those shares and had this great big block, but it wasn't enough. Mm. So you had to stray out and speak to strangers, almost cold call strangers. And every time you cold called a stranger, you don't know how that stranger would react. You could re- either say, well, uh, yeah, they're awful, I'm with you, or pretend to be with you, then call the board up. And that's exactly what happened. And that's when the, the cat was out of the bag before we got to the 50%. Had we got to the 50%, you know, what took two years would have taken six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was a war of attrition. Uh, between in 92 and of course March 94 but that, that's all the sort of the 
the backdrop, the coming together of different individuals, mm -hmm. the sort of serendipity of certain aspects to it. Uh, yeah. Very time consuming. You mentioned John Keane as one of the heroes and I, I'd be quite keen to stay on John just for a, for a moment. Um, he's, so when you're, you're travelling about, David, to Belfast and to Canada and, and various places trying to buy up these these different shares, is John the, providing the capital for that? Is that his? his he's own? providing most of the cap, cap, capital. Uh, eh, John Keane's the only guy other than Fergus that did exactly what you said he would do mm -hmm. from the beginning until now. I mean, he's still around. Him, yep. him and Fergus are both, well, in, into their 80s, yep. comfortably into their 80s. Uh, but John Keane was committed from the very beginning. If Fergus came over, and he, Fergus can be very brusque and very abrasive. And again, one of the things I, I told him with you, that I told him, and you, you knew this anyway, that is you, when you come here, you're the stranger coming to town. You've got to surround yourself with uh, or get three or four different big Celtic guys involved. You can be the cornerstone investor, but was, your prospects of success will be infinitely improved if you get million pound uh, cornerstone backers uh, uh, and you know there was a few people that came into that category but the only guy and I mean the only guy that delivered said he would deliver at the very beginning when all these guys are having conversations is John Keane mm -hmm. so Fergus did what Fergus always said he was going to do John Keane did what John Keane always said he would do and has always been supportive uh of Fergus when he was there, and indeed it's the board subsequently. But he's, he's an old man now, so I, mm -hmm. I've got nothing but good things to say about John Keane, and that's, I can't say that about the others. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, I think there was just so much going on at that time and lots of underhand practices in different ways from different folks, but Fergus is obviously the the headline grabber, you know, from all of these times, you, you know, your own book is called The McCann Takeover, and that's what everyone references, but just, you know, in short, how important would you say is the role that John Keane played in, in saving Celtic, essentially? He, he, he played a very, very important supporting role. If you want to put a label on it, he was never going to be the main man with the main money uh, and the guy that oversaw the complete reconstruction of the football club on the ground. He was always, because he had his own business, mm -hmm. uh, um, and he wasn't the type of personality he, he used to handle all the crap uh, that, that was coming. He, even Fergus didn't know the crap that was coming, if I can call it that. So John Keane was asked to perform a supporting role, did and always delivered, never let anybody down. And to this day, uh, you know, Fergus McCann is, is, is very, would, would say very effusively, effusive positive things about John. As, yeah. as would anybody that knows him. Mm -hmm. It's good to hear that. And to bring it back on to, to Ferguson, so you've mentioned that first meeting uh, and you've obviously quoted what I was going to quote. Who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? You know, very, very short and sweet to the point. But I think I think you liked that style, David. You knew yeah, exactly. Yeah, saves a lot of time, you know. Yeah, you knew where you stood. Um, you'd mentioned that, of course, that Fergus tried to get involved, I think as early as 1988. And yeah. he'd financial marketing expertise in the sporting world, I think mostly through golf. But he was frustrated in his efforts. I think the likes of Chris White and others ultimately sent him back to Canada with, with nothing to show for his yep. efforts. And he became a bit frustrated. His Celtic credentials are never in question. Grew up in Coalsyth until the age of, I think, 22 before emigrating to Canada and was a member, as you say, of the Croy CSC. But yeah, the, the Croy CSC see, left without paying his dues. But yeah. that, that's just an urban myth. A rascal. <laughs> um, but take us from that time then. So you, you first met Fergus in 1992. Take us briefly, if you can, David, from there until the takeover in March 1994. What's the key events of those times? Well, it was on, off, on, off uh, over those two years, you know, because everybody's got businesses and lives to learn. But what was apparent is that when the board found out, uh, they were freaked. Because number one, they had no idea that anybody would buy shares that couldn't get registered. So what I would do when somebody sold shares uh, would get a stock transfer form, which is the piece of paper that permits the transfer of shares from one person to another. And you can just hold that uh, in escrow until there is a board uh, that is willing to transfer the shares in into the share register. And I also got what's called a, an irrevocable proxy. 
uh, for any general meetings or any votes that took place at the club. So what, what would happen is, and indeed that was very, very important, because what happened is the board was so freaked uh, that we ended up with this big stake that they did two things. They called an AGM to remove Jimmy Farrell, an old Glasgow lawyer, uh, his firm, Sean C. Quigley McCall, he was Celtic's lawyer, or uh, and, and Brian Dempsey's lawyer, and to remove Tom Grant, because Tom Grant was seen as one of the rebel faction. So they called, and, and they fully expected to remove both of them from the board and to appoint this guy, David Dallas Smith, to the board. So as for seminal moments, the seminal moment was when uh, we went to the court session and got a whole lot of unlawfully transferred shares booted into touch, to use a rugby euphemism, which meant that we succeeded in keeping Jimmy Farrell on the board. Uh, Tom Grant, unfortunately, jumped ship, if you want to use a, a cliche, and signed a renewed uh, Warsaw non-aggression pact, the point of which was to solidify that 60% um, block and stake, but the main take and the main takeaway there is that uh, our group were never going to go away. Our group was always going to be a thorn in their side. It was never going to go back to the way it was. Uh, ultimately, there had to be a, a solution, uh, and we had also showed them that uh, you can be beaten uh, in an AGM. So that was a a big moment. Um, the situation just continued to get worse, though, because Rangers were winning and Celtic weren't. Rangers had money, or apparently had money, as we subsequently found out, uh, and we didn't. So it, was, it wasn't like every week, every day, every month, every year. Uh, it was just a, a slow grinding uh, descent and periodic meetings and periodic fallouts, you know, <laughs> Because again, our side, you know, didn't really get on, or you know, it was just Celtic that bound them together. Then we called uh, an AGM in November nineteen ninety three, an annual general meeting, because we had shares. We were allowed to call a meeting, and at, and at that meeting, uh, we proposed an injection of seven point two million pounds. This is from memory. Some anorak can probably correct the number, but uh, and a meeting took place. And we lost it, and everybody was pretty disappointed. Or, but but I wasn't because when you thought about it, that was the beginning of the end. Losing that was the right thing for the rebels, because what it told the the, the next day, what well, metaphorically the next day, what happens is the bank calls the club up and going and says, "What are you doing? You know, you're insolvent. You've maxed out your overdraft." and you're knocking back all that money, what are you doing? You're going to have to come up with the money from somewhere. So that, rather than being a defeat, you know, was the beginning of the end for the board because they knocked back real money from real people. Yeah. Uh, and that's where, for, it was at that meeting that Ferris McCann came out with this statement, you know, money doesn't guarantee success, but no money guarantees no success. And we had no success and we had no money. So that was the end of November. It might have been the 26th of November. What's that? December, January, February. Within three months, three and a half months, the takeover had taken place. Mm -hmm. And it's important to note as well, David, for anyone who doesn't know, and most will be aware that the Rebel Alliance, to, you know, to call your group that, wasn't the only show in town. There was other parties certainly interested in, in taking over Celtic which was headed up by Jerry Weisfeld, Wally Hockey, Michael McDonald. What was the, I was going to ask, what was the, the relationship, the dynamic between your group and theirs? Were you viewed as, as rivals? Were you in communication with each other about ultimately goal number one being removing the existing board? What was the, what was the dynamic like? Well, that, that, that's where uh, readership of the, the Prince by Nicola Machiavelli uh, comes in handy because uh, nothing ever was as it appeared. Mm. And uh, you have to assume there was always subplot, subterfuge, all sorts of off-balance sheet conversations and alliances and uh, shifting positions taking place 
And if you've read the the the, the Prince, and it was you that brought it up, <laughs> not me, uh, you'll know that's what it's all about. Um, tactics, manoeuvrings, yeah, how to win, uh, th or work your way through the maze, mm -hmm. so to speak, of politics. Uh, so all of that's going on. Yeah, I'm aware it's all going on, but you don't tell anybody it's all, all going on. Uh, at the end of the day, I was always hardline Fergus, because for me, Fergus was the real deal. He wanted to do it, he had the skill sets to do it, and he had the money to do it. Everybody else was the supporting cast, in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my view from the moment I met him in that meeting in Montreal, when he laid out his stall. Um, and John Keane I've already spoken about. Uh, I came to the same conclusion with John, real Celtic man. He's got the money. He doesn't want to be the main man. And so I put him into the trust him box. Uh, but you're right, there's a lot of uh, personalities kicking about and as I call it, the glittering prize is becoming available. That's a, that's apparent. You know, for me, that's apparent from uh, November onwards when we lost that AGM but really won it. Mm -hmm. That's when the clock started ticking down for the board. They didn't know that either. So when it became apparent that uh, the club was going to be in play, uh, you know, there was another... Uh, group, they were headed by Gerald Weisfeld and some cross crossover between the two groups, the Fergus group and the Weisfeld group because mm -hmm. some of the people circulating around just wanted to be uh, part of the winning group you know? uh, so again I was aware of all that so eventually the bank as became apparent after the November meeting said well you ran right out of credit you're going to have to give us some personal guarantees. This is to the directors. Otherwise, the thing is going into receivership. And again, this is what they did with Rangers in uh, 86. You know, they ran out. They maxed up their uh, overdraft facility. They wanted their money back or, you know, there's going to be an insolvency event. And then David Murray stepped in and he became the new Mr. Ranger as well. Something similar was getting played out with, with the same bank uh, and Celtic. So they had... Uh, uh, the uh, Celtic version of David Murray lined up and of course that was a uh, Gerald Weisfeld so if we're now getting right up to uh, the week preceding uh, March the 4th uh, and there's two factions on the board there's the Michael Kelly um, what's his name uh, White, Chris White faction and then there's the Kevin Kelly, Jack McGinn Tom Grant faction so Weisfeld got his lawyers together and uh, the Michael Kelly faction tried to bully the other faction into uh, going to uh, through to Edinburgh to sign away the club. You know, if you don't do this, we're going into receivership. If you don't do this, you'll all lose your houses. You know, like, it's pretty heavy stuff and scary stuff if it's not stuff you're used to. Machiavellian, uh, some might say. Yeah, well, it was dirty dealings, yeah. Uh, right through this whole period and it's at that point that our group gets approached by Kevin Kelly who tells us all this so I said well don't go to Edinburgh mm -hmm. oh, but we're going to go bus no, don't go to Edinburgh you know because you'll just get bullied into signing something you, that's not in the best interest of Celtic not in the best interest of you what you should do is arrange because you're the chairman Kevin you know you should call up the bank and arrange a meeting with the bank and we'll go and see you and so, and, and bring along it was actually uh, Dominic Keane because he, he was a banker I think he no he wasn't a banker at that point but he'd been a senior guy at the Royal Bank so Kevin Kelly he goes off to uh, the bank with Dominic and the bank gives them, them their terms so the bank has to listen to them because it's the chairman of the, the company can't not listen to them, they can't not of the meeting because mm -hmm. this is a, a, a director and it's the chairman so they have to listen to him so they basically tell uh, Kevin that we want a million pounds um, within 48 hours and another 4 million uh, by the end of the week so they come back to meeting we gathering all of, of all our little rebel group as you call it 
Rebel Alliance, sorry, and uh, it says this, they want a million pounds, and then they want four million pounds. So that's at that point I call Fer Fergus McCann, uh, and who's playing golf in Phoenix, Arizona, which is, I don't know what that is, that could be 4,000 miles away. Uh, I basically said, uh, your time has come. Mm -hmm. They've folded, they want a million pounds, uh, 48 hours, and then four million. Uh, if you're going to do this, you've got to come now. And that's what happened. So, and I'm not dramatising here, leaves the golf course and starts uh, the journey back to Scotland. And remember, there's no instant wiring like you've got today. The journey of the money mm -hmm. from, uh, I, I don't know, his account in uh, New York to... Uh, to uh, to Glasgow, uh, as it transpires, he he got here before the money, because you know as there was no in instant transfers, it was all paper forms, dollars going from London or sorry from New York to London and London to Glasgow, then getting converted with another paper form into sterling, and, and then another cre bank credit deposit slip or whatever it's called into into the bank account. It was all this all this crap, so. Fergus gets the call, comes over, and that takes you up to the fourth of March. So the money gets the money gets here before he does, because the money is his money is already in his bank. I'm not going to name the his bank; that's personal. And uh, it then gets transferred to Bank of Scotland. And did we talk about this earlier? Been talking so much, I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, walk up St Vincent Street, uh, up in the elevator, the sixth floor of the. Uh, Bank of Scotland, a guy called Roland something, I can't remember his second name, deputy, big title, uh, produces all these papers, sign them all. I'm there as a witness. I sign the paper and uh, they get their million quid. And uh, I look at my watch and it is 11.52. This is not urban myth. This, this, that's exactly what happened. Money transferred at 11.52 uh, on uh, the 4th. You then head up to uh, Celtic Park, uh, where you know crowds are gathering because they know something's going down. And at that point, I should say all that's happened is that Cel uh, Fergus McGann's put in motion a plan where he's just going to replace the bank as the unsecured creditor. The bank was a secured creditor of Celtic. He's taken them out, and he's become the um, the unsecured lender. He's not on the board. He doesn't have any shares. He's very exposed. Technically, if the board don't do as he says, he can uh, put them into a receivership. But, you know, that ain't going to happen to our football club. So that's what happened on the day. And just in terms of, yeah, so the the, the events of, of that morning, you pick up Fergus at the airport, I think, Glasgow Airport, as he arrives in. Um, and he had to do the whole, whatever it was, to JFK, to Heathrow, to Glasgow. So there was a, lot, a yeah. lot of kind of, you know, different things going on there. But you pick him up take him into the city centre, you, you carry out the banking. What was your own feelings, David, particularly, let's say, at 11.52, because it's a, it's a journey of at least a couple of years. You've spoken, I think, potentially before we started recording, saying it could and should have maybe taken about three to six months, but it's been two years in the making. You know that you're you're in the crux of something big and the crux of achieving what you've you've been looking to achieve. How were you feeling personally at that moment, say, as you drive up to, to Celtic Park with Fergus, knowing that things are about to happen? Uh, well, there's, there's still a lot of work to do, uh, but for me anyway, the usually in, in business the chase is better than the catch. So I'm not like oh really excited and oh this is brilliant, you know. Although it is, you know, uh, there's still an awful lot of work to do because as I said, he's not on the board, doesn't own any shares. They're still the directors. They're still the shareholders. They're still in charge. It just means that they owe him money. Mm -hmm. You look at it that way. So we're in the building, we've got them in different rooms, you know, they want money to go. And that's one of the only times I can, very few times I can remember getting Fergus to change his mind about anything. That is, look, this is a one and only chance. You're very exposed here. I've got this other guy, Wisefelt, uh, sniffing about. It's now or never, you're going to have to give them some, some money. So cut this bit short. We basically we gave them a, a cake, money, a bunch of money to split any way they want amongst themselves, uh, which is what happened. So did deals, White, Michael Kelly, David Dallas Smith, 
um, took their money, resigned as directors. Fergus went to the board as a director, and, and that really was the important bit. The important bit was getting control of the board because uh, that enables you to do things. Uh, but you still wasn't in control of the company. He had some shares, but he didn't have control of the company. Um, because Gerald Wise felt had lost out, he started buying shares from the Whites and Kellys that had no none of the only get crumbs from the cake, so to speak. So some of them had big slice of the cake, didn't leave enough for the extended family. They wanted out as well. Gerald Wise felt he built up a blocking stake. I'll talk about a blocking stake if you want. Yeah. Um, so what that meant was Fergus, if Fergus wanted to convert his, and he had to put another four million in. So within a matter of days, he's into it for five million unsecured, but it's debt, it's not equity, it's not control. So we're working on a resolution to, uh, shareholders resolution to convert that debt to equity shares to create a controlling position uh, and to register all these shares that we'd bought and accumulated over the years, but just waiting for the right board to transfer the shares from the seller's name into the buyer's name, all, all of that kind of technical stuff. But in order to make that happen, it required the support of General Weisfeld. He had the blocking stake. He'd built up a stake of 25%. And to do what we wanted to do was a 75% um, approval was needed. So I had to do a deal, deal with him. Uh, it was quite tortuous, but we got it done because it was in everybody's interest to get it done. And that deal was that uh, he would provide money for uh, Michael McDonald. And, and Willie as well, Willie, sorry, Lord Hockey, I beg your pardon, uh, as, as well. And uh, if they joined the board, and that was it. So they joined the board with the money and supposedly it's peace in our time. <laughs> that was far from the case. Yeah. But basically that, that was pivotal. <laughs> That's never really talked about or written about, you know, the fact that Gerald Wise felt had a, a blocking stake and we had to do a deal with him. So there was two big deals in a week. It started off with a deal with the board that was leaving and it ended up with the deal with uh, Gerald to get him on side. And uh, that's what created the platform for moving forward in in the spring. And, and just to go back to that that meeting with, with what became the old board then at Celtic Park on the night of the, the 4th of March, you're in that room then, David. You're there as a an advisor to, to yeah. Fergus. What's that like? What's the atmosphere at a meeting like that? Is it tense? Because you're ultimately saying, we're here to move you on. You just kind of don't really want to move on, but we're going to make it happen. What's the atmosphere like in a meeting like that? Is it, you know, does it drag on? Is there raised voices? Is it... Well, fairly enough, uh, we all ended up in the Walford restaurant at different tables. And uh, and that's when it was, it was over. So you get... The, Table of losers down one end, and then you got our sort of little table at the other end, and um, eating fish and chips. I seem to remember. Uh, so I don't remember any great euphoria. Uh, I think it was all very tense. It was all very tiring. Uh, I, I don't remember you know, over celebrating, but I do remember when Michael Kelly was leaving, and he passed Fergus McCann, and uh, Fergus said to him. <laughs> And goodbye, Mr. Kelly. I hope I never see you again. <laughs> I always remember that. Or words similar to that. Uh, was there a response to that? I don't think so, but neither Michael Kelly, Chris White, or David Dallas Smith have ever been back, mm. as far as I'm aware, yeah. to a game. Like Celtic fans, but never yeah. returned. Never returned. Uh, so, you know, in some of this, I've been pretty critical about uh, Kevin Kelly... Jack McGinn to Tom Grant, but what I would never do is take away the fact that they did the right thing to make all of this happen. Mm. And uh, they are as big a Celtic fan as you would meet anywhere. So nobody's perfect, but they did the right thing in the end. And certainly uh, all of them continue to go to games mm -hmm. for years and years, even to this day. Yeah. Okay. Um, you've then got the, I suppose, the iconic moment where Fergus comes out I'm sure you were in the vicinity Brian Dempsey's front and centre and it's Brian Dempsey who comes up with the line or certainly says the line the game is over the Rebels have won the chat is that Fergus uh, he, Brian wanted to say the battle is over but Fergus changed that you can maybe confirm that or not but why do you think it's Brian Dempsey 
who, who as you said, hasn't put up any finance for it, and not Fergus, who, who makes what has now become a, an infamous statement. Well, that, that sort of a show-offy bit, you know, the big grandstanding bit, it's not Fergus's style. I mean, I mean, it is as simple as that. It's not, it's not in his style to come out, you know, to a big audience of euphoric big audience and a wet night and and do that sort of thing. I think his subsequent behaviour, departure, uh, 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 and even to this day, is, is, it's out of sync. That's not his style. Brian, on the other hand, is right up his street. You know, uh, Brian Dempsey is a fantastic orator. Mm -hmm. Orator. There was lots of self, Save Our Celts meetings in the beginning. Uh, early 90s morphed into uh, Celts for Change uh, later. Uh, Brian Dempsey would speak at it, and, and I'd go, wow, I mean, this guy's brilliant. Um, now, his father was Jimmy Dempsey, the Labour MP, and uh, Brian once told me, you know, he learned all his oratory at the feet of his father, who, who was, funnily enough, was blind and very eloquent uh, guy. MP for Airdrie Cope Bridge for very many years. So Brian's a fantastic orator. It's perfect for that, you know, the game is over, the rebels have won. Another one I remember at one of these candle rigs meeting was uh, Celtic is a love affair we carry from the cradle to the grave. <laughs> All that stuff and everybody's going, oh, brilliant. Oh. Mm. You know, so he, that's, he, that's Brian's strong point. Successful mm. businessman and all that, but he's, he's, he's the man you want for all that. Um, Present presentational stuff, mm -hmm. and and obviously things then didn't work out between Brian and Fergus. You know, Brian Dempsey never became part of the the new setup moving forward. We obviously know in the months and years that follows, Fergus helps to launch one of the most successful share issues in football, generating ballpark twenty one million, and then to completely transform Celtic Park. And bit by bit, we then find that success on the park that's been missing for such a long time. Was there ever a suggestion, David, of you yourself joining the board? And was that something you'd have been keen to get involved with at the time? No, that's not my style, not something I'm interested in at all. I, um, I mean, I'm Glasgow born and bred, stay in the West End. Uh, it's, I like my lifestyle. I like getting on with doing the thing, things that I do. Uh, quite happy to stay involved, and I was involved right up to the noughties. You know, there's a whole story after the takeover. Because I remember on a uh, thinking this always happens with it, lots of different situations. Like, am I allowed to swear? Go for what, what the fuck have we just done here? Because it was a shambles. Remember, there's no due diligence. You don't know what you've bought. Mm -hmm. uh, I seem to remember somebody had bought a whole lot of football jerseys, but the same amount of shorts and socks. So there was every place you turned, there was Celtic shorts and socks hanging out of drawers. <laughs> Because people would buy jerseys, but not the socks and the shorts, and there was photocopier photocopiers around every corner, and you know, and oh, people suing Celtic for this, that, and the other. It was it was a shambles, and far worse mm -hmm. than anybody had had the time to to work out. You could even see, and then the accountants come in. Panel Care Foster, I think mentioned them earlier. No, that was Rutherford Manson Dowds. Different firm had come in and uh, checked the books, and it was, oh my God, you know, it'd be easier to put Celtic into uh, administration. You know what that is, you know, <laughs> and uh, then to pay off all the debts. But mm -hmm. again, there's another Fergus McCann quote we, wouldn't, we won't do that because that's embarrassing for Celtic, you know. So everybody got the money. So it, it was a shambles. Mm -hmm. And one of, and so to answer your question, I, I no interest, never have had. Because it's too high profile. Uh, it's not enjoyable. In fact, the whole time I was there, it's very difficult to enjoy watching Celtic because you've got an eye on another financial ball and mm -hmm. you're not watching it for a game. You're watching it from a different, through different uh, different lens. So, uh, no, I, it's not for me. Yeah. And you mentioned there, and I think I read that it was Dominic Keane that carried out the, the due diligence over a couple of weeks after the takeover and I believe he found all no, sorts it wasn't of stuff. Dominic Keane it was accountants panel care Foster mm -hmm. were brought in as accountants uh, for the club and they were commissioned to carry out the due diligence which normally happens before you buy mm. and they, they they found all this this stuff yeah a few yeah. skeletons in the closet lots of skeletons I actually found 5,000 Rangers shares in the, the biscuit tin and 
and sold them. Right. A pound a share. It's a pound a share, not a pound for the lot. Mm -hmm. Just a Got you. big difference. So, yeah. I mean, to take it into current times, David, so obviously we're, we're in a situation now, 2024, um, even though Celtic are, are successful, certainly, you know, domestically, and we're on a, a sound financial footing. There are many fans who aren't happy with how things are currently being run. And the goal back then, I'm sure, uh, in 1994, was for the club to, you know, quote unquote, to be returned to the fans. But in reality, fans have very little say in Celtic at this moment in time, at least in any sort of notable boardroom level, um, can't really influence to a huge extent what goes on. What do you think of that? Would, would you like to see changes such as fan representation on the board? You know, how do you feel about how things are currently being operated? Uh, well, I'm against fan ownership because it doesn't work. Uh, what you want is a balance uh, between fans and professional board. I mean, Motherwell's an example of how it doesn't work. I mean, it sounds great. Fans got control, but now they're looking to you know bring in some professional in investment. Uh, I don't like the way Celtic run, run, run just now. Uh, I think the problems at Celtic are as big, if not bigger, than the ones we had back in the 1990s. Um, but to go back to the ownership thing, there was a fallout of... Because the other thing that Fergus said is, this is going to be a five-year job, and after five years I'm going to go because I've got other things to do in my life, but I'm going to leave something that's going to last. That is a stadium with 60,000. But before you got there, you... you Everybody's saying, oh, what do you want 60,000 seats for? Our average crowds are only, from the beginning of time, are only 32,000. And his attitude was, uh, no, if you build them, they will come because you have no investment in the stadium since 1919. It's a, you know, if, if we build a stadium that's a comfortable experience, uh, people will come. And... Well, we missed out the share bit. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I'm talking effusively about Fergus and how brilliant Fergus is and how brilliant John Keane is. But yeah, the other two things that are very, very relevant to what was created uh, in the late 90s is the board that Fergus put around. Fergus assembled a very serious board of very competent people who knew what they were doing you know, there was Brian Quinn, governor, ex deputy governor of the Bank of England. There was Sir Patrick Shee. He had a good finance director, Eric Riley. He had a, a banging board, and he did not all, always get his own way, because that's what you know. Fergus was the chairman and mm -hmm. the chief executive. He was both, and he's very forceful with the way he things want things he wants done. But he had a strong board, and that's often overlooked. I think we've got a weak board just now. The other thing he did is, I'm leaving after uh, five years and I'm going to offer my half that I have uh, to the other half. And there was people on the board that didn't want that. There was people on the board that wanted the board to control the sales process and for fans to have less and from up for, for others to have more. Mm -hmm. And there was a dispute or an argument, whatever you want to call it, at the time. Uh, but Fergus was adamant that what he said was going to happen is going to happen because it's very, very important that there is a counterbalance between the fans, its ordinary supporters, and what you would call professional investors uh, that don't have any emotional involvement with the club. That's a good way of putting it. And that was achieved in 1999. But since then, it's been lost. It's been lost for three reasons. Number one, there was another share issue. So that's at this point, there's been three share issues. There was a one in the summer of 94, whereby myself, others, and all these other people that had bought shares in the accumulation phase put money into the club. Then there was the big share issue, 94, 95, at Christmas time. That's when all the fans came in, and that was key. That was a key element. And the fans' contributions is huge and should never be underestimated. But that's two, sh three. And then when Fergus sells, that's three share issues, and then two thousand and one, there was another share issue. Well, after, yeah, I think it was around about the time John Barnes gets sacked. And for fans, this is the only share that they're going to buy. Really, they're not going to buy other shares because they're buying it because it's Celtic. Um, so when a big when a share issue came along in two thousand and five, 
it was called a deep discount rights issue at 30 pens. The fans are all shared out at that time. Can't buy any more shares. I've got them everywhere. That allowed that because less and less fans were buying shares in the share issue, that allowed the fans' percentage ownership of the club to reduce, mm. which is unhealthy and bad, but that's what happened. Um, I wouldn't say it happened deliberately, but you know that's what happened. The other thing that's happened is that because football supporters across the board are what's called in investment circles unsophisticated investors, they don't, and why should they, understand the protocols associated with uh, owning shares. And what that means is that if you flip, move house, you know, there are, a lot of people are oblivious to the fact that you've got to notify the club's a registrars, you know, what's a registrar? And that registrar is the person that records your shares. And if you move move home from A to B, you know, they record it. So you continue to get correspondence from the club and dividends from the club. Uh, so as the years have passed and more and more people have flitted, Glasgow phrase, more and more shares have become untraced. On top of that, people are dying, obviously, that this is 30 years ago. So if you have a relation who's died, it doesn't naturally follow that if your dad died, that you inherit the shares. Somebody's got to get in touch with the registrar. So that doesn't happen either as often as it should do. So between those two factors, and this is true of most football clubs, not just Celtic, there's an enormous un untraced percentage of shares which accumulates over the years. Mm -hmm. And you got to remember, this is the process that allowed the old board to stay in control with a minority position. Housing flats were knocked down, tenements were knocked down. You know, nobody knew who the shareholders ever were. Uh, so the same thing is happening just now. The percentage of untraced shares is increasing all the time. And what that means is if you've got 40% of 100% and 20% is untraced, your 40% becomes 50%. And in 10 years' time, it'll be more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So that all the time that's consolidating uh, ownership of the club in, in fewer and fewer hands, uh, where, which is not healthy, irrespective of who it is. So it's a, what I'm saying here is a matter of fact rather than uh, <coughs> being critical of any one individual. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. So football clubs should be... Uh, if not owned by the fans, certainly the fans should have a, a bigger say than they have certainly at Celtic. I don't think Celtic fans get treated well uh, by the board. I think they get milked with all these 0831 premium rate numbers and getting charged for this, that and the other. They're over milking a, f a finite market and uh, I don't think okay, fans get the respect that they're due. I also think the, the board is stale. I don't think the, N the NEDs, the non-executive directors, are truly independent. I think that they're in the good grace of the dominant shareholder, that type of thing. And I find all that very worrying. Uh, but as to what can be done about it, you know, that's that's for others to decide. I, I, I've got too many commitments to get involved in any of that. Which would take me to what's just about my final question, David. Um as I say, you know, we're here 30 years to the date, almost to the minute, you know, after after those huge events. And as discussed, I'm sure it's, it's likely a time that you'll, you'll never forget from, from your life. And I just want to ask you, I suppose, a pretty straightforward question. If it came to it, if things changed, if there was, you know, more faction at, at Celtic, would you do it all over again? You mean, like, now? <laughs> no, that's for, uh, that's for uh, others uh, to get involved in. Um, for, for me, the biggest, the, the, the most embarrassing thing about Celtic is its performance in Europe. Europe, We are everybody's easy touch. Mm. We used to be uh, respected in terms of football in Europe. That's the Celtic I grew up with uh, and all people of my age grew up with. Where it's now embarrassing now. Our benchmark used to be Benfica, Ajax, uh, clubs like that. Now, you know, we get regularly beaten by... I've forgotten half of them because they're so insignificant. You know, certainly Danish teams 
uh, a lot smaller than Celtic, uh, provincial teams from here, they're there and everywhere. It's, it's embarrassing. Uh, and I, I find that particularly unpalatable. Uh, you know, I, I, I just think the biggest challenge facing Celtic, it was, it was true then and it's true now, is, to, is to, for me anyway, this is controversial, is to get out of Scotland. I, I, I think we're too big uh, now. Uh, but just to be clear, being financially big and having 60, 70 million pounds in the banks is not a boast I don't want to hear about. You know, this is a football club and as long as we're solvent, yeah, that's all that matters. We shouldn't be accumulating cash for for little apparent reason. Uh, but financially, you know, Rangers are nearer hearts than they are Celtic financially as we speak. That might change if they get their hands on the Champions League money, which will be record money. That, but that will take them a lot closer to Celtic if Rangers were to win the league uh, this season. And of course, it's very possible that they, they, they do. But at the end of the day, being champions of Scotland with such mediocre opposition is presents a, a bigger and bigger step in Europe. You know, the step up into Europe, which uh, has stronger leagues, uh, more technical expertise than in Scotland, is, is is making it very difficult. Although you know, Rangers are, are an exception in some of the Euro Europa Championships. They, they 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 do better than us, but uh, I, I find it very unpalatable that we are so poor in Europe. Agreed. I mean, do you think there's a prospect of Celtic at some point, and it's obviously been talked about for so long now, but entering some sort of European League, Atlantic League, something something different from what we're currently seeing? People have been saying there's going to be change, uh, you know, for the last 25 years. Alan McDonald was a chief executive straight after uh, Fergus. You know, he had ambition, ambitions to do this. We talked about Atlantic Leagues then. It was the same with, uh, what's his name, uh, Ian McLeod, you know, and then it's all sort of petered out. At the end of the day, there's four big leagues, then there's France, and then there's us away down the pile. The difference between our league and Benfica and, and, and even Denmark and uh, Holland is that there are more, there are more, there's more than two teams that can mm. compete. And there's like four in Portugal, you know, it's Sporting, Benfica, Porto and, and Braga. And then Holland's got half a dozen as well. It's basically Celtic Rangers and and nobody really. It's like forty years since uh, another team won the league. Uh, so that's not healthy. Uh, but you know we've got less money than Bournemouth and Brighton, which is ridiculous, because <laughs> they are a uh, little fish in a big pond. We're mm -hmm. a big fish in a shrinking pond. And in ten years' time, I think the problems will be worse. It's always possible that jurisdictional change, multimedia, television, streaming can change the boundaries. You know, uh, we are a recognised brand, as they call it. Uh, the, the whole Irish thing is very popular, 45 million Irish Americans. We could piggyback in that, you know, uh, and gain some traction, you know, that would be good. But whilst we're stuck in this league, we're going nowhere, unfortunately. Yeah, it's a concern, no doubt. Um, just to, as we head towards the end here, David, just to finish on, on a far more positive note, obviously the the focus of this this mini series is such as on Fergus McCann and the the takeover yeah. that took place in '94. I was going to ask, first of all, are you are you still in touch with Fergus? And also, what do you believe his legacy is and should be at Celtic Park? Yeah, I, I, I'm still in touch with him. He was over here for the Celtic story, which. Uh, uh, Co-produced, I suppose you would say, with a couple of friends. Mm -hmm. um, I do, yeah, I do see him regularly. He's not changed. Uh, and, and shares a lot of the concerns I've articulated, although neither of us have any proposals as to how you change it. Um, I think that's for a younger generation to come up with. Uh, I think we need a Celtic Shareholders Association, you know, a, a binding uh, organisation. But you never, pe fans don't do anything until there's a crisis. That was true in 94. They don't moan. As long as we are winning or beating Rangers four times a season, you know, that, that's, that pacifies most people. Uh, doesn't pass, pacify me, but it does pacify most people. So, yeah, I do see him regularly. What was the other bit, the question? Just his <laughs> legacy. How... No, he's one of the, the, the greatest Celts of all, all time. There's no, there's no question about that. He, he changed the, the, the trajectory uh, of Celtic... Uh, and domestically, 
if you think about it, those 10,000 seats that everybody was saying, what, what are you doing? 10,000 seats. 10,000 seats more than Rangers, that's what I'm talking about, times 50 quid, times 25 games a season. That means even before we kick a ball, we are £10 million or whatever that sum is ahead of our nearest rivals. So that's a £10 million a year advantage, year in, year out, year in, year out. It's what you do with it, um, that economic advantage that's that's important. Uh, and, you know, if we don't really get our ass into gear at Celtic until there's a crisis, if you look at it. Mm. Barnes is rubbish, you know, so we'll go and get uh, Martin O'Neill. So nobody's buying season tickets. Uh, half the stadium's empty with Ronnie Dahlia. So we get Brendan Rogers. You know, it's like stop, start, stop, start. Uh, it's there's, there's a lot wrong, but mm. we're solvent, isn't that brilliant? You know, know. you get sixty million in the pounds, fantastic. You know, yeah, it just feels. Yeah, I agree with you on that point. You know, we're far more reactionary as a club than, than proactive, and that's a, a general concern for a lot of folk. Um, just the last point on Fergus: should he be? I know he's still alive, but immortalised in some way in terms of North Stand named after him, statue in the Celtic way, something of that nature. Do you feel that the club have kind of failed to recognise him? Yeah. Look, I I, uh, I, uh, I think Frankie Miller should have a statue. You know, Frankie Miller from Brigton. Yeah. Uh, and I spoke to him, he stays in London, and uh, he said, you'll get a fucking statue till you're dead. Uh, so is that not true? Yeah, yeah, Fergus McCann, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's insulting for some, you know, we get a statue, you're supposed to get that when you're dead. So, it uh, should definitely have one. Who have you got out front? Is it Billy McNeil, Jock Steen, and Jimmy Johnson? And uh, Brother Walford. Brother Walford, there's f four. Uh, Brother Walford never played Cel for Celtic, but he pl was instrumental in the foundation. Uh, Fergus never played for Celtic, but he's instrumental in taking us into the 21st century. Of course, he should have a statue at some point. Yeah, yeah, I'd like no to question. Think so. Or a stand, you know. But you know, I think he's got a touchy relationship with some of them as well. You know, yeah, I think he's that kind of guy as well. As you say, he's very forthright. He, he's very what you see is what you get. And yeah, wouldn't would you rather it. have that? Very possibly, I have to say. <laughs> Saves the Machiavellian stuff, doesn't it? Yeah. David, uh, we're just about to finish up. Sure. Any any final thoughts on that? Special, interesting, dramatic time in your life. Uh, looking back, you know, it was good fun. I, I don't remember any negativity to it. I, I enjoyed it. You know, it was a real challenge. Uh, I always believed it could be done. Uh, yeah, but I, I just, it happened. And there's challenges now, though. I, I'm always living in the present. You know, I, I don't sort of think back too much. Uh, about about it, but uh, and it's <laughs> it's a long time ago. I was a young guy at the time, you know. Yeah, and as we speak, it's eleven forty-five. It's just about that time, right? From you want to ago. finish this interview at eleven fifty-two? <laughs> we could run it on about, but David, I think it's a perfect time to stop. So, a huge thank you for joining us here in the Celtic Exchange and for for being so frank and for sharing your story. And thanks, of course, to all involved during that time. Without it, we might not be sitting here talking about Celtic today. So, thanks, David, and all the best. No problem. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.